Hello, and welcome to the 40th anniversary celebration of the Eye in the Sky on Vermont Public Radio. I'm Scott Finn, President and CEO of VPR and Vermont PBS, and it's a delight to have so many of you gathering here today virtually to celebrate and honor 40 years of this vital partnership with the Eye in the Sky and the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium. This partnership was a groundbreaking one when it was launched 40 years ago, and it's a model for many others today. We're gonna to have a special lineup of guests to share their reflections of the last four decades, and we're gonna look ahead to the future. So I wanna thank our event sponsors, RK Miles and Otter Creek Awnings. And I wanna thank all of you who financially supported both VPR and Fairbanks Museum all these years. Here to guide us today is our Morning Edition host, Mitch Wortley. Hey, Mitch. Hey, Scott, thank you so much. And hello to everybody who's watching virtually today for this 40th anniversary celebration of the Eye on the Sky and its partnership with Vermont Public Radio, which really is special. We had nearly 300 people sign up for this event. I don't know how many are actually watching right now, but hello to all of you and thank you so much. It's not, no surprise to me at all that so many people wanted to be here today for this. I'm Mitch Wortley, but I am delighted to be your host today. As Scott said, we'll be looking today back at the history of this vital weather partnership, the challenges of providing concise and accurate statewide forecasts in Vermont, and we'll look ahead to the future as well, of meteorology in a changing climate. Now, in just a moment, we will invite in our guest of honor, Mark Breen, to join us. But before we do that, let's just get a bit of a taste of what a day in his life looks like, letting all of us know what to expect before we step outside. This used to be the Eye on the Sky offices and broadcast studio, and it was designed so people could come and visit us and, and see what we were doing. But there's one little tiny casement window <laughs> until we got those new studios. That was our eye on the sky. We would physically go outside and see the sky, but yes, we've got two windows now and they're, we're on the second floor. We can see all kinds of weather. Yeah, yeah. From the Fairbanks Museum in St. Johnsbury, this is the Eye on the Sky weather update. A cold front remains to our north and west. That'll give us a somewhat mild day today. There'll be periods of sunshine, a light westerly breeze. Yeah, so this is our observation area. It's been in the backyard of the museum since 1894. And this is the instrument shelter, as we call it. And it's essentially houses the, the thermometers because you want to measure the temperature, but you don't want the sun shining on them or the wind on them and the rain and so forth. So inside here, there are two thermometers and they measure two different things. This measures the minimum temperature that shows that it got down to 16 degrees last night. And then this, this is actually on a swivel. So what we do is we actually spin it around and it's like a, uh, an old fashioned instrument you used to measure, you know, your, your own body temperature. You have to shake the thermometer. Well, in this case, it moves the thermometer back down to the current temperature. And our official uh, observation time is four o'clock in the afternoon, which is an odd time, but that's because that's how they were doing it in 1894. So we decided instead of changing it, which would affect how long the records would be the same. We've kept it that way. So we have those observations going back to 1894. This is our official snow here. <laughs> we measure, we actually, you can see there's two levels here. So I measure how much snow, this is uh, swept at four o'clock yesterday. So it's just shy of two inches. But then this snow just stays here. In fact, you can see our snow stake here when we, um, it's only once got up uh, to the 60 inch mark many, many years ago. So now I sweep the snowboard off. The other thing that I'll do before I leave is we have to grab this bucket. And that it's open to the air so it, it actually uh, collects the uh, snow or rain, but we measure that inside. So especially this time of year, we've got snow in here. We want to find out how much water is in the snow. So we have to melt the snow in here. We run hot water over the outside of this. It'll heat up the metal bucket, the snow will melt, and then we pour that water into this tube. 
and we use the the dipstick so it shows on the stick just how much rain has fallen or in this case melted snow and that would be 0 0.15 0 0.15 or 15 hundredths of an inch and so that goes into our weather records and that's the, the next thing that that we'll do is we'll we'll write all this down obviously different people have different experience but let's face it we're all affected by the weather i still get up in the morning ready and excited to do the forecast after 40 years. Oh, so cool. And joining us now is the voice behind your daily weather report with that signature. Good morning. I can't do it as well as you can. <laughs> it kicks off each report. It's senior meteorologist and planetarium director at the Fairbanks Museum and to many just affectionately known as the eye on the sky guy, Mark Breen. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mitch. How you doing? I am doing really well. It's so good to be with you for this today. I love that little video that we just saw. Uh, thanks to Mike Dunn for directing that and Anna St. Marie for doing some production assistance on that as well. Gives us kind of a behind the scenes look at what you do, uh, the painstaking methods that it takes to measure the snow, official snow. I like that too, by the way. <laughs> so I want to talk to, uh, as we kick this off, a little bit about some of the initial challenges of doing these daily forecasts. And I guess it kind of starts with something you and I are both pretty familiar with, which is getting up pretty early. Yes, yeah, so of course, uh, you know, my day begins about 3.15 in the morning. And, uh, you know, that's just part of being the the early morning weatherman. Uh, you know, not everybody has to get up that early, but uh, in order to have it prepared, uh, like you said, you know, it's, it's certainly a challenge to gather all the information together and get that ready uh, to make sense of it. So it takes uh, at least a couple of hours to be able to go sort through all of the data that comes in and then, you know, whittle it down into a forecast that hopefully makes sense for the entire region. And, and that in itself is a challenge. We have uh, a listenership that runs all the way from Montreal down to Massachusetts and out to the Adirondacks and, and into New Hampshire, of course, obviously Vermont uh, in the middle of all that. So we have to be able to work the forecast details in so that we hear what everybody's going to experience. Accurate forecasting is difficult, I think, no matter where you are. But, you know, we've heard that expression. It's kind of the old joke. If you don't like the weather in Vermont, wait five minutes. It's going to change. <laughs> uh, true here. True a lot of places, though, really. I'm wondering, though, you know, how did um, how did you decide to deal with the region's variable terrain, as you just talked about, and the resulting microclimates, too? I mean, how do you go about creating all of that and then getting encapsulated into one 60 second or 90 second forecast well in some ways we're still working on it uh <laughs> you know always trying to find a just slightly better way to describe a particular pattern we often use roads now i, I we've had very many many questions over the years you know why route two or route four as though the weather actually knows where those roads are but <laughs> <laughs> instead think of it this way most of us know where those roads are, uh, as opposed to county boundaries and that type of thing. Now, the, the weather services, they do use county boundaries. And that makes sense for them. But for us, especially on the radio, where we don't have the visual part of it, so uh, roads are probably one of the more familiar landmarks. And so that's one of the reasons that we use those. You know, doing this over four decades, you have not seen it all because there's going to be more. There's always <laughs> something, as you know, but you have seen an awful lot. I wonder if you can tell us about some moments that you're just never going to forget, some challenges that you had personally, maybe even getting to the station or just getting where you needed to be to let us all know what the heck is going on with the weather. Yeah, you know, it, in general, it, it's one of those to get here early in the morning. Not all the road crews are out, for example. Um, I can remember one morning after Hurricane Floyd actually having to bring my chainsaw to make sure that I could cut through enough trees to get in, and that, that worked fine. But uh, probably the most memorable thing, and, and I still hear it's a story that it happened uh, in 1984, so fairly early on in the eye on the sky, but uh, we had a tremendous snowstorm. Uh, in fact, it, uh, at the time, record for the 24 hours uh, for the greatest amount of snow at that time, 36 inches in 24 hours. And so I barely got from Lindenville, where I was living at the time, to the interstate, turned off the interstate, and they hadn't plowed the ramp. <laughs> 
And in my little Chevette, it just wouldn't go anywhere. Uh, so I had, and of course, time's been going on. I've been shoveling and so forth. I finally get to St. Johnsbury. I'm looking at my watch. I've been walking about a mile with snow almost up to my waist. And this woman's out on her porch cleaning off her, her uh, steps. She says, do you want a cup of coffee? I said, well, I don't drink coffee, but it sounds good. So, <laughs> But she invited me in and I realized I, there's no way I was going to get to the museum to do our forecast. So I literally asked, I said, would it be okay if I called from your living room and did the weather forecast? And she said, sure. So with, and truly I had no information other than it snowed a lot. So I did the weather forecast from the Warren household in St. Johnsbury back in March of 1984. I have a feeling that she has been telling that story over and over again for quite <laughs> some time. Did she know that you were, you know, Mark Breen, eye on the sky at the moment, or were you sort of just meeting for the first time? She must have been curious why you wanted to use the phone. Well, uh, you know, uh, I don't, I, I mean, she knew I worked at the museum. I think that's yeah. probably the, the, the connection there. Um, you know, eye on the sky was still growing at that point. Um, so it wasn't the eye on the sky. It was just, Oh, here's this poor guy just coming up the street. <laughs> <laughs> what a great story. And, you know, that that is the point. These are the early days of the eye on the sky. And yeah. so I, I want to sort of follow up on that a little bit because there there is a unique collaboration between VPR and the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what makes that relationship special. Yeah, you know, really uh, across uh, anywhere in, in the country, there are very few... Uh, places where uh, an institution like the museum um, has the opportunity to be able to educate the public and provide a service. And that's really kind of the combination. You know, Eye on the Sky is, is not just a weather forecast. We have the opportunity to, to help people understand how the weather works a little bit better. Um, it's, so it's a great opportunity to, to educate the public. Um, but to have that connected with a public radio station or even a public television st station that just it really doesn't happen any place else. It is a wonderfully unique uh, relationship. Mark, you've already impressed us with the fact that you get up at 3.15 in the morning, <laughs> measuring the snow, sometimes <laughs> stopping at strangers' homes to deliver the forecast. Okay, we get it. You're Superman. But, but <laughs> the Eye in the Sky is a collaborative effort, and it, it is a lot of people doing a lot of work. And actually, it's a, well kind of a fairly small team given how much you all do, but tell us about starting the eye on the sky, getting it started and who was involved in that effort, that, that effort to get it off the ground. Right. Um, you know, the, at the time, nothing like this had been done. And Ray Dilley, who was president of Vermont public radio at that time was from St. Johnsbury. Um, and so Ray thought it would be great for Vermont public radio to have uh, a weather forecast that came from Vermont. Uh, and he knew that at the Fairbanks Museum, there had been for many years, uh, uh, the weather being done on the local radio station. And so he approached uh, the Fairbanks Museum. And at that time, there was another younger fellow at that time, Steve Molesky. And Steve had started working at the museum. Uh, and so it was just perfect timing. He happened to be there. He had... Uh, just graduated from Linden State College, and he was ready to tackle the weather world. And I believe that Steve Molesky is with us today to help celebrate these 40 years. Hi, Steve Molesky. Great to see you. Hi, Mitch. It's great to be here. Yeah, I was very fortunate to be um, kind of in the right place at the right time. Uh, I had come up from Connecticut to go to Linden State College, and had fallen in love with the Northeast Kingdom. And so was looking for a place to work in Vermont, if I could possibly stay um, in meteorology. And the opportunity to work at the Fairbanks Museum came up and I accepted that job um, wholeheartedly when it was offered to me. Uh, and then the, um, the opportunity to be part of a new program with Vermont Public Radio came up and being um, a young guy just out of college, basically I just sat at the table while Bill Brown and Ray Dilley worked out all the details. I just smiled and looked pretty um, <laughs> while, they, while they did all the business stuff. And then beginning in December of, of 1981, 
we started those programs. I can remember how nervous I was um, just holding the phone because I'd never done anything like this before. Uh, it was Mark showed the, that little clip of the uh, the, the basement uh, office there. Well, that was luxurious compared to what I had to work with at first. Uh, I, I had a little desk that faced a wall um, with a floor, a concrete floor that had mushrooms growing out of cracks <laughs> in oh, the gosh. corner, and an old, um, uh, I don't know what what was that old ancient kind of plastic that they used back in the 1920s. It was one of the very first kinds of plastics. There was a name for it. Oh yes. So. <laughs> um, but that that kind of foam, very heavy plastic, and rotary rotary dial. Right. And uh, Mark Hull was the producer, and. Uh, so I would get up at around four o'clock in the morning and walk in because I lived in St. Johnsbury at the time and uh, take note of uh, what I saw in the sky and then would enter the museum and call up what we had to work with, which was fragmentary compared to what we have to work with now. We had an old service A teletype that dated from World War II and I flipped a switch and called up the uh, weather observations from along the East Coast and plotted a, we a weather map uh, from the 5 a.m. OBS and also uh, got the National Weather Service summary and worked up a forecast from that and then recorded it at 6.45 with my knees shaking, literally, my <laughs> knees shaking. I remember the first day my knees were shaking. I was so nervous. There's the, a, uh, I, I want to ask about you know, meeting Mark that that first time, the two of you, I am sure, I, I am guessing that you have a passion for the weather and everything that makes it so integral to our lives. And mm -hmm. did you kind of knew that know that you two were birds of a feather when you first met, and this was going to be a great partnership? Mm, not really, um, because didn't go long, did you? <laughs> I, no, no, it, it wasn't that we were working together. Uh, I actually recruited him and John Talbot at Linden State College because I got recruited by my old meteorology professor, Joe DeLeo, to work down at the Weather Channel when it started up in 1980, early 1982. And I accepted that job because I realized that getting a job on the ground floor of a new company didn't come along very often. Yeah. But uh, that would have left the museum in a really tough spot with a new program like Eye on the Sky. And then, yeah, so I remember Steve. Steve mm -hmm. posted the, the job at. Yes, uh, I, 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 I came up to to this was just after Christmas break. I remember coming up and I saw that, and of course it said you know early morning. Well, this was my senior year. Why would I be getting up at four o'clock or three o'clock in the morning, my senior year? But Steve really, I mean, he seriously twisted my arm. He said, "You really, <laughs> really need to do this," um, and so. I mean, really, within a couple of weeks, um, I think I started the first uh, broadcast I did was February uh, of 1982. So just a couple of months after Eye in the Sky started. Yeah, yeah. It's because you guys, you and John stood out uh, among all the applicants. And I figured we, we really need to get somebody good for this for this program. And Mark really stood out. So, I, yeah, I, I used all my powers of persuasion <laughs> to, to, to get him to take the position. And he did such a great job that after two years, he needed help. And so I came back north. Uh, Another person who's there been there really since the beginning uh, is Betty Smith, who's also been yes. at DPR since the very beginning. There's uh. Betty right there. Uh, <laughs> Betty is joining us as well today. Uh, Betty Smith, delighted to be with you today here uh, with this virtual event. What can you tell us about the origins of the Eye in the Sky partnership? Um, you know, and some of those folks who were so important to making this really a successful launch from the get-go. Well, we were committed from the very beginning to try and tap the region's uh, talent and uh, intelligence, smarts, experience uh, for our programming. And I was uh, tasked with putting together the first uh, programming grid for VPR. And in talking about weather forecasts, Ray Dilley, who had grown up in St. Johnsbury and worked at the museum mm -hmm. for uh, a legendary man named Fred Mould, who was very much involved with the museum and started, that's Fred, uh, mm -hmm. with school kids. Um, he was, uh, he started 
he started the weather forecasts, I believe. Um, Mark and Steve might want to confirm that. But yes. Ray said, uh, this guy, you need to call up the museum. Uh, and I think Fred is retired, but you want to talk to, uh, I think it was Charlie Brown, um, and see if they would like to do weather forecasts for you because they've got the, these years and years and years of data that, that Fred has seen to it. They've gotten collected and then and saved and it'll form the basis for a really interesting weather forecast and so I did and uh, it was it was an immediate hit people thought having weather that was really local uh, for us at that point it wasn't getting a, sort of a national service it was getting somebody who was looking right out the backyard um, was really uh, exciting and they got a you know, people in the region got behind it right away. And it's been uh, an important part of the service ever since. So one of the things that has struck me over the years of listening to the Eye in the Sky forecast is, and I, and I wonder if um, Mark and Steve, you can both talk to this. There is a literary quality to what you produce. And I think Betty was just touching on this because you can get a national forecast. You can get somebody from somewhere else saying, this is what the weather is going to be in Vermont today. How did you think about the writing of these forecasts as a way to either put it in your own voice or make this particular for the people mm -hmm. of Vermont who would feel like, yes, we are getting a really local forecast here? Well, you know, I can certainly say, I mean, uh, Steve and I, we were just traveling over here to, to Colchester and we were talking about various things, but it included, um, you know, books and and. Uh, I mean, Steve, I just know he's he's just so well read. Um, he he's incredibly thoughtful in terms of, of how he approaches that sort of thing. And, and at the same time, I had been uh, actually uh, at Linden State, I had been doing uh, some of the theater programs. So so mm -hmm. both of us had the, the this uh, sort of different perspective. So in other words, it, it wasn't a uh, just a mathematical scientific exercise. This was. Um, you know, a fascination with the weather uh, that, that you mentioned, but also uh, just a, a fascination with with the how that integrated with the, the rest of, uh, you know, the, the outdoor world and so forth. And it, it was uh, just a, a great opportunity to to share all of that. Steve, how did you approach it? Like Mark says, it wasn't a conscious decision on our part. It wasn't anything premeditated. It just flowed out of who we were. Uh, what you heard on the air was an extension of who we are as people. I know that when I present, presented a, a forecast, uh, and this flowed from some of my experiences in other places that I'd worked, um, I always tried to treat my audience with respect, to respect their intelligence, to assume that they were intelligent, uh, and interested uh, to speak just a hair above about what they might be comfortable with, not to put them off, but to stimulate their interest and curiosity so that they might be stimulated to look uh, a little bit beyond themselves uh, and find out a little bit more about the world around them uh, and about the weather as well and, and how the weather ties into the larger world. Uh, in which we find ourselves and with which we're all connected. Yeah, it really comes through. Um, Betty, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about uh, some of the community partners who were involved in, in the launching of the Eye on the Sky. Well, um, it certainly was, um, it, it, we had membership that was, that was supportive, but we also had uh, people in the community who kind of got behind it. In the beginning, of course, finances were always uh, tenuous. The first few years of VPR were um, building up an audience so that we had support. And I think at one point we even wondered if we could continue to support. I think the museum uh, had to think about that from time to time. There was never any outside fund support, to, you know, to, to mention. It wasn't like anybody had a great big huge grant to do this. Uh, it was penny pinching. And at one point we had uh, people come through to keep it going. Um, and it was also people made contributions during the, the early fundraisers with uh, the weather forecast was always frequently mentioned. There was very broad community support from, from the get-go. 
And I think that um, we, we had some people who were involved uh, that made this happen. Um, I think one of them was named uh, Robert Susi. Is that correct? This is, again, before my time, so I don't want to step on you folks. But what, what can you tell us about his involvement? Well, he was a banker um, and he was also a, a fan of EPR before it was that well known. Uh, he laughs and says that, you know, not everybody at the bank was listening to VPR at that point, but he was. And one day somebody told him that we might not be able to sustain the uh, weather forecast for lack of funding. And I'll be darned if he didn't just decide to go and make it happen. And he did. And he's told us about it. Thank you, Mr. Susie. Thank I did not you. know that. <laughs> yeah, he did. I think we even have a testimonial from him. Hello, my name is Robert Susi. I was an executive with Vermont National Bank who had overall responsibilities for our network branches from Southern Vermont to Northern Vermont and from Eastern Vermont to Western Vermont and spent many hours on the interstate roads traveling to the branches in our many locations. While traveling, my radio was always tuned into VPR's various signals available throughout the state. One day while on the road, I heard that I and the sky would need to be cut because of funding issues. I don't remember exactly what I did, but I pulled over to the side of the road and called someone at Vermont Public Radio and said that Vermont National Bank would step in to fund the programming. Now, weather forecasting was something I've always been interested in and whenever I in the sky would be doing their weather forecasts, I made sure I was tuned in. Now, what I really got hooked on was listening to Mark and Steve explaining the weather and forecast predictions and making it understandable and interesting. In addition to that, they were not afraid to admit their misses the next day and explain why, which was nice to hear. Well, after many years of listening to VPR on a regular basis, I knew there were many Vermonters that depended on the weather forecast from eye on the sky for work, farming, school, family, travel, recreation purposes, etc. I did not want that to end. So a partnership was formed that lasted for many years and I was always very happy to have been instrumental in that relationship. I wish to congratulate eye on the sky for their success and wish them the very best for the next 40 years. really something um i just love that, that 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 visual of him pulling off to the side of the road and calling up and saying you know what is more vermont than that it's like mark's story about you know going to somebody's house to have to do that weather forecast when there was no way he was going to get to the to the museum on time uh very fortunate obviously to have robert care that much about these forecasts to fund them in that way i found it interesting too that he appreciated the fact uh mark and steve that you would not be um you were transparent with the listeners and when you missed something hard for me to believe but it happens <laughs> you would say so uh, can you give us sort of an example of that at times when you had to come back maybe the next day and say you know hey sorry i said we were going to get 14 inches of snow and we only got two i'm sure it wasn't that egregious but there are any memories like that you can remember talking to people well, about well first of all i want to say that that testimonial means a lot to me mm. um that really spoke to my heart um and I want to say to Mr. Susi right here that I, I truly appreciate that. Hmm. Uh, it just makes my day professionally. Um, as far as misses go, <laughs> happens all the time. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just part of the the science. Um, the, the the weather, the atmosphere is a dynamic, and incredibly complicated. Um, uh, feature and trying to forecast its movements and with any great degree of accuracy is a v extraordinarily difficult proposition. Uh, we use the world's largest computers to try to do that. The world's largest computers. This is true. Hmm. Um, and even so, we, we make misses. Uh, 
the state of the science has advanced incredibly in the past 40 years. Mark and I were just talking about this as we were driving over. Uh, when we came out of college, a two-day forecast was pretty good. Three days was stretching it. Five days was, you know, you, you were out in la-la land. Yeah. <laughs> um, and now um, a five-day forecast is pretty skillful. Uh, you can get some useful skill out to, out to 10 days. Um, it's not just throwing darts at a dartboard anymore. And our understanding of some of the large scale drivers of the atmosphere, like uh, I'll mention a few things like uh, uh, La Nina, El Nino, Southern Oscillation, the Madden Julian Oscillation, things that were just coming onto the scene when we were coming out of college and just barely beginning to move out of esoteric academic journals um, have given us some skill in, in forecasting um, general outlines of weather with some skill um, anywhere from, you know, six to 12 weeks in advance. Uh, I think one of the, the magic parts of that though, and it's what Steve does so well is, so you have all of this information and, and it's great and it's on the computers and so forth, but then to be able to figure out how is it going to exactly behave in Vermont or in the Adirondacks or oh, the yes. White Mountains, yeah. that localization, <laughs> and honestly, that is a learning curve that continues <laughs> right to, to today. You know, I'm still finding out, and this is where listeners have been invaluable sharing their information about how things work in their location. That, in fact, the, the errors are just as much uh, in, uh, as much as uh, a helpful piece to it as it is, you know, when we do occasionally get it right. So, so the idea here is that you know, localizing it, trying to figure out exactly how the, the green mountains are going to affect this particular airflow. I actually, you know, you're talking about one of the misses. One of the most challenging forecasts I remember was the ice storm of 1998. Oh yes, and. Oh. It was fascinating because there were places where the air was rising and therefore cooling. And so the ice level went up and we weren't expecting that. Uh, you, you know, it was it was so complicated in terms of where the ice was. And and that's just just one of a thousand examples of how the forecast, even with it, when it was wrong, we were learning from it. Yeah, yeah we, it's, we'll, it's, a, it's a lifelong process. It will go on as long <laughs> as we live. And yeah. I, I saw John Haddon's. Um, Yes, I was going to mention comment here on the side audience. here. And uh, hello, John. I, I, I'm i really happy to hear from you. I, I read your comments on my laptop every morning, and it, it's a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you um, for for your comment. He we said, should let people know. He said, you certainly stimulated my interest in the weather. Uh, yes. There it is right there. And uh, I think that's true of a lot of people uh, who listen. I think people who were you know, the weather affects all of us, as Mark said in the clip we saw at the very beginning. But I think that the way you present your forecasts really gets other people more interested in, in the weather. Some of the expressions that I've heard, Steve, uh, you put in, in the weather forecasts, um, vortexes of certain kinds, which I can't remember exactly right now. <laughs> uh, I got sparked to look that up myself and say, you know, that that's really interesting. And we're really experiencing one of those right now. It's just all part of this amazing uh environment that we all live under and we're all beholden to that uh, in some ways. It's wonderful. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the unique partnership uh, between VPR and the Fairbanks Museum and how important uh, that partnership is. We have had a lot of people um, over the years, uh, you know, talk about this kind of partnership. And we had this um, testimonial from Adam Kane, I believe, the executive director of the Fairbanks Museum, which we should uh, hear from now. Hi, my name is Adam Kane. I'm the executive director of the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium in St. Johnsbury. I'm so pleased to be wishing Eye on the Sky a happy 40th anniversary. For the Fairbanks Museum, Eye on the Sky is a great partnership that we have with Vermont Public Radio. It lets us push the mission of the museum out well past our walls and be much more impactful than we would be otherwise. So what I thought I'd share very quickly with the uh, viewers of this is some anecdotes about those four gentlemen that you hear on the radio all the time. 
So Mark Breen, many people don't know, is an avid golfer, hunter, and gardener. And a few years ago, uh, he fought viciously over a uh, packet of seed garlic at a Yankee swap uh, so that he could get that for his garden. Steve Molesky, who's also been with the Eye on the Sky since the beginning, uh, is just as thoughtful of a person as you hear on the radio, and he is also a tremendously devoted trustee of Linden Institute. Lawrence Hayes is an incredible photographer, in fact, to the point that we had him do a weather calendar for a number of years for us for the museum to showcase his uh, artwork. And Chris Kurdek, uh, is a beer aficionado uh, to the point that we have him, he helps us orchestrate our brew fest every summer and for some reason he knows all the brewers. So um, from, from the Fairbanks Museum, we're so happy for this partnership. Happy 40th anniversary and we look forward to the 50th. Thank you. Like that little behind the scenes uh, <laughs> news there about uh, the different things that you all do. Uh, Mark, if I'm not mistaken, also, and I'm not going to ask you to do it right now, you apparently have a lovely singing voice. Is this true? Um, that That's a matter of opinion, but um, I, I sing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Whether people like it or not, I've heard it's actually quite good. Um, a little bit more about uh, this, the, the, the partnerships, the, you know, the people that are really have been so important uh, to the eye on the sky over the years. Um, you know, it's a statewide service. Again, everybody uh, here really cares about the weather and, and the way that you two deliver it. Um, I believe we have another testimonial that we heard from uh, folks in New Hampshire that I actually know quite well, uh, Mark and Susan Hardy. Uh, I believe they also wanted to uh, just sing your praises, if you will. <laughs> this is Mark Hardy calling from across the river in Plainfield, New Hampshire, in the Upper Valley. Just wanted to leave a note on behalf of my wife, Susan, and me, thanking Eye on the Sky for your 40 years. We appreciate the context that's provided for the weather. We're both weather nerds, and we really enjoy not just hearing the forecast, but hearing about the weather. And it's just been a wonderful experience to have a reliable, accurate, and interesting weather forecast that goes a little beyond just the temperature and whether it's sunny or cloudy and what's going to happen tonight and overnight. I tease my wife all the time because she follows several different weather services that give reports that sometimes differ from yours. And frankly, yours is almost always more accurate than the ones that, uh, that she quotes to me, particularly about things like whether we're gonna get precipitation or how much precipitation we get. So it's a matter of some amusement in our house. A little bit of amusement in someone's house and talking about the weather. Uh, Mark, before we, we bring in uh, another really important voice uh, to this conversation that folks know well, um, I wanna ask again uh, about how, because it's, it's really unique, this partnership uh, with Fairbanks, with DPR, Eye on the Sky. It's also groundbreaking. I mean, this was just not something that was done before. Can, what, what else can you tell us about how unique this has been? Well, probably one of the things that, that made me realize just how unique and, and, and uh, amazing it was. I mean, you know, we've had this great partnership. I, you know, I feel uh, like, you know, we're part of each other's organization um, in, in a way that, I guess I almost think that, you know, I walk in the door of VPR and, you know, it's just another home. Um, but I was at a conference in California uh, several years ago, and it was a conference specifically to try to get museums and libraries connected with public radio institutions. And it turned out that we were really the only one that were doing that. Now, this is a nationwide conference. Um, and so we became sort of the example. And then, then we heard later that, that somebody was specifically speaking uh, at a different conference in New Orleans, and they brought up our partnership as the, kind of the example of how, um, you know, an institution, you know, like a, a museum would, would be able to forward not only, it, you know, its uh, ability to, to let people know what's going on at, a, at an institution, but it gave us a chance to educate. It gave uh, a voice uh, to an institution and just really kind of enriched what was on the air. I love how that happens. It's it's serendipitous. You didn't know you were groundbreaking and yet yeah. 
you find out going to these other conferences like the, oh, okay this has never been done before it's quite yeah. amazing um i want to thank uh, betty smith for sharing some of her remembrances uh of this incredible partnership over the years letting us know about the importance of ray mold and uh excuse me uh Fred Mould and Ray Dilley, uh, thank you, Betty, so much for that. It's it's just wonderful to have you as part of this discussion today. It's really been great. And I also want to talk about uh, some of the other folks who have really sent along. Uh, they were we asked people to record some of their uh, feelings about uh, the eye on the sky forecast, what it's meant to them. We heard, um, you know, that in a state like ours, where a reliable weather service is so important, and the trust, the word trust comes up a lot. And uh, that was a word that our good friend and volunteer Rick used when talking about the importance of the eye in the sky. I'm Rick Barrett, and I live in Richmond. We know that activities in Vermont are weather dependent. However, when planning our day, we don't need to extend a wet finger in the air. We don't need to rely on our bum knee, nor do we need to hang our heads out a window. We can just cast an eye on the sky. Better yet, we can listen to Mark Green, Steve Molesky, Lawrence Hayes, or Chris Kurdak, as they have been keeping their eyes on the sky for 40 years. For detailed and up-to-date forecasts, I go to VPR and listen to Eye on the Sky. That in, Rick, that is wonderful to hear. Uh, the Eye in the Sky was created to provide a, a comprehensive view of the region's complex weather events. It really was. And, you know, put them into context as well. Find specific areas where listeners might be affected in different ways by storm patterns and weather systems. And in order to provide an accurate and reliable statewide service, Eye in the Sky gets additional help from volunteer weather reporters. And let's hear from one of those volunteer weather reporters right now. Hi, my name is Joanne Ecker, and I'm from Heartland, Vermont. In 1995, my husband and I moved to Vermont from Southern California. Almost immediately, we found Eye on the Sky on VPR, and their weather commentary helped us to adjust to our new weather seasons. In January of 1998, while listening to Mark Brink give his noon weather report, he mentioned that they were looking for volunteers to report the weather from their towns. I contacted Mark, and now as I begin, my 25th year of weather reporting for Heartland, I thank Eye on the Sky for igniting a passion for weather that I will never forget. Congratulations and happy birthday, Eye on the Sky. Volunteer weather reporters, how, how'd you get people to do that? How'd that happen? <laughs> just, just what Joanne said, literally on the air said, hey, we need somebody reporting. <laughs> and it, this came out of one of the very early forecasts, and I remember this, I still remember this. It was my very first summer forecasting, and there was a hailstorm that hit Bennington, but we didn't have a report of it. So I went on the air, and I'm talking, <laughs> oh, it's a lovely, beautiful June day, and I get this very agitated phone call, understandably so, from somebody saying, wait a minute, we have this horrible thunderstorm in Bennington and two-inch hail. And I realized we didn't have, not just Bennington, but anywhere. And so we, the call went out and a number of people responded. And over the years, you know, some have moved away or, or faded out. Others have picked up the ball. And so we've had this wonderful, wonderful uh, connection. And it's really a community connection, you know, to hear from different people in different locations. And that kind of report is very different than, you know, it's 13 degrees and the wind is from the north at four miles an hour. We get great descriptions uh, from from our, our wonderful, wonderful observers. I think it's so cool. I, I, Steve, you were laughing like you remember that Bennington uh, <laughs> incident pretty well. Do you? Uh, I'm, it just brings to mind a couple of similar incidents with me. Um, I, I remember one where I'd forecast a, a sunny day um, across Vermont, and it verified except for uh, a very short period of time when a, about a 10 mile long line of showers moved again across Bennington County <laughs> um, for about 20 minutes before dissipating. 
and I got an irate phone call from a gentleman who was understandably irate because he said, I just want you to know, Maleski, that um, $600 or $6,000, I forget which, must, must, may have been $6,000 worth of um, fungicide is, is now running down between the rows of my apple trees. <laughs> it's like, because I sprayed because you said it was going to be a dry day. And it was like, oh, Ouch, that really hurts. But it was the it was the only line of showers that entire day in Vermont. It was and it lasted for 20 minutes. It was in Bennington County. I still feel for that gentleman. Um, oh, but you know, again, not your fault, but I, I hope he was understand, you know, understandable uh as time went on. You know, it is so difficult. There's so much weather changing all the time, and it could be raining in one part and sunny in the other. This is what you guys deal with every day. Let's also hear from uh, another listener who sent in a testimonial. This is from our friend John Reed. My name is John Reed, and I live in Rockingham, Vermont. I'm a retired educator and certified weather geek. And uh, I've always appreciated listening to uh, Mark Breen's Eye on the Sky Weather Observations. I've been sending in daily reports from Rockingham here for f over 15 years. I email them to him and uh, I always enjoy the insight that he gives in his complete weather picture. Uh, sometimes we even trade little weather barbs and puns back and forth. I just think that the, uh, the Eye on the Sky is just a, a wonderful component of uh, Vermont Public Radio and it's a great part of my life. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Mark. Really nice to hear. Um, Mark and Steve, I understand that there are folks who basically will call you regularly. Um, you know, that you're getting used to hearing from them. You've got this like stable of, again, again volunteer reporters out there. Uh, one of them is named uh, Jonathan Morse. Let's hear from him now. My name is Jonathan Morse, and I live in Marlboro, Vermont. My family has been listening to the Eye on the Sky since it started 40 years ago. In addition, I have provided observation data from our home for many years, starting before we had a computer, when I called Mark and Steve on the phone every morning. I feel that I know them as friends, even though I have met them in person only a couple of times, because Mark and Steve have a very personable way of talking on the radio. My wife and our daughters have enjoyed their informative chats, and I have appreciated their scientific thoroughness. In many ways, they have been part of our morning routines, and it has always felt like they were speaking directly with us. I hope that the Eye in the Sky continues for many years to come. Thank you all very much for the years of pleasurable listening. I think Jonathan touched on something really important right there uh, in that lovely testimonial, which is that you do, it does feel like you're speaking directly to us. And, and that's something that's uh, a skill, you know, not just in weather forecasts, but in radio in general. Uh, so I want to thank you both for, for being able to do that. Um, are you okay? And be honest here. Are you okay with folks like Jonathan calling you and talking about the weather like this? In other words, you've never felt tempted to say, Hey, we're the pros here, right? Let us handle this. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my um, absolutely. I, yeah. I love um, talking with Jonathan. Um, I communicate with him on my laptop almost, you know, every day um, with short little notes. I loved receiving his, his reports. Uh, I look forward to them every morning. Yeah, I, I think, it, like I said, you know, it's so invaluable to have these personal connections uh, with some of our, our listeners and observers. Um, and we do indeed get phone calls from various listeners uh, kind of out of the blue and, and they love talking about the weather as much as we do. So um, either will uh, they may have a question, they may have a, a comment, an observation, you know, all of this continually kind of fits into our understanding of how things are and, and how the weather affects people. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, getting the forecast right is great, but it also, you know, did we make sure the message got across? Did we, do we make sure that they knew mm -hmm. when to, you know, cut the hay and, you know, that type of thing. Right. Yeah. 40 years of doing these forecasts, 
a lot of weather events. You you guys both spoke briefly about one of them, uh, the 1998 ice storm. We, we, we must talk about the big one, though, that was more recent than that, and that's Tropical Storm Irene. What do you each remember most about that? What was most challenging about it? Was it at all, did it catch you at all by surprise? I mean, it really did a number on this state. Hmm. Go ahead, Steve. Um, I'll, I'll just start by, uh, I'll let you take the bulk of it, Mark, but I'll just say, no, it didn't catch us by surprise. Uh, we could see that it was coming uh, and that it would be very serious uh, because there had been a tremendous amount of rain um, throughout the spring and the early uh, summer. So the soils were saturated uh, before that event so that um, we knew that there would be serious flooding. Uh, the National Weather Service also saw that and did an excellent job um, predicting the, that there would be serious flooding in all major rivers uh, throughout Vermont uh, when Irene came up. Uh, so no, it, was, it wasn't a surprise that there would be would be serious flooding throughout the state. Mark? Yeah, I, I think one of the, the biggest challenges was to be able to, to take the information that we knew and make sure that the public was aware of the serious nature of this. Um, and it, it definitely presented some challenges, no question about that. It was, um, I, I just remember, you know, how do you emphasize this anymore? Um, and uh, you know, between, you know, the, the Weather Service and, you know, however, People got their information. Um, and, you know, hopefully, Eye on the Sky contributed to the idea that, uh, you know, with such a major system, so much rain, such devastation across the state, and yet um, we we had a very significant, uh, you know, I, I, I guess not savings of lives, but but only four. I shouldn't say only four people did perish in that storm, and that you know, always a tragedy. Uh, but the last storm of that kind of magnitude, 84 people lost their lives in Vermont from the flood of 1927. So, you know, hopefully it, I mean, in the bottom line is, you know, one of our very, very, very most important things is to make sure that we're saving people's lives. I mean, that's, that's job number one for the weather. Yeah. And you do that. You do that. Um, I want to ask briefly, too, if we can, if maybe this is too obvious a question, but we can expect more weather events like this, especially given climate change. Now, you, you two probably, and everybody at the Eye in the Sky, probably gets a lot of these comments all the time. The weather is not the climate. They are different things, uh, which I'm sure you'll explain. But given what's happening with climate change, can we expect to see more events like Irene in the not too distant future? Uh, one of the things that, that we've done with our weather records at the museum, you know, they, they've been recently, the last decade or so, digitized. Um, and by doing so, uh, we've been able to even better analyze what we have for information. One of those things, uh, somewhat uh, akin to I, Irene, is there more frequent heavy rainfall taking place? Um, and, and so, you know, that is something that, uh, especially since uh, the 1930s or 40s, has been increasing. Um, and so there's the value of, of not only you know, being able to forecast, but also how does that fit into you know, the past weather events? Uh, it's why the museum's weather records, which extend back to 1894, are so, so invaluable that way extend all the way back to 1894. That, that, that is remarkable. Uh, we have folks who have um, done some more testimonials talking about other really big weather events as well. And uh, we heard this uh, from Rob Christensen, who sent this in. Greetings from Hillsborough Upper Village and happy 40th to all the eye in the sky guys. We've lived in this house since 1981. I started reporting in June of 1983 when Mark looked for volunteers. This house was built in 1835, so it's seen a lot of weather along with the Eye on the Sky guys. We've always used Mark and Steve and the Eye on the Sky guys for our weather source, even though I have a number of other sources that I go to. They're the bottom line, and now Chris and Lawrence added to that mix. Had a lot of events. Uh, some of the highlights here were uh, 1987, when we had about five and a half inches of rain at the beginning of the month and finally finally wound up the month with 17 inches of snow i remember mark predicting 1993's blizzard on friday noon just prior to that uh, saturday night sunday uh, 
dousing that we got, about 30 inches of snow. And, of course, I remember uh, Steve Molesky getting about as dire as I've ever heard him on the broadcast, just uh, forecasting on the Saturday before August uh, 28th, 2011, when Irene was ready to hit. Uh, he said, I guess tomorrow being Sunday morning, we'll all just go out and survey the damage. So we've had a lot of events here, including uh, last winter, uh, just before Christmas, 24 inches of snow that was all gone uh, from the storm on the 18th and uh, the 25th, it was all gone. We just uh, appreciate the program so much. It's really our bottom line of the weather. So again, happy 40th, Eye in the Sky, guys. Hear how many people are as passionate about the weather, covering it and, and making sure it's accurate as, as you are. It's really wonderful. It's so lucky to have these great volunteers here. I want to hear from one more of them. Uh, this is John Haddon from Huntington, Vermont. My name is John Haddon, and my family and I have lived in the western foothills of Camel's Hump in Huntington, Vermont for over 35 years. One of the most memorable weather events that I've seen here would have to have been what I call the Big Blow of January 1st, 2010. On that day, a nor'easter tracking up the eastern seaboard created strong and sustained winds which blew down the western slopes of Camel's Hump. The winds blew non-stop for most of the day, and I watched as the trees around our house swayed back and forth, being wiggled out of the ground like loose teeth. The sound of snapping tree trunks cracked the air like gunshots. My wife, who was the mail carrier in town at the time, was out on her rounds, and she reported watching trees fall in the road behind her as she made her way up some of our back roads. Not a fun day to deliver the mail. By the next morning, the winds had abated, and over an inch and a half of rain had fallen. The woods around our house looked like a battlefield, with broken trunks and uprooted trees tumbled everywhere. Roads were blocked and power lines were down, and it took line crews over five days to restore power. Overturned stumps and snapped trees are still visible in the forest floor to this day, where they are slowly rotting reminders of nature's power. Great remembrance there from John Haddon and uh, keyed into that literary sensibility we were talking about earlier, the way he described those events was quite remarkable. And again, somebody who understands the importance of these weather forecasts, uh, really appreciate these testimonials so much. I do want to bring another voice into this conversation now because, um, you know, the, the team has grown over the years and uh, joining us now. And, I, you know, if it was up to me, by the way, I would turn this conversation to what we heard was one of his passions, but this is not the topic today. I'm talking about Chris Kurdek and his love of craft beer. Chris, you and I are going to have to sit down and talk beer at some point and maybe have one or two. Thank you so much for joining us today here on the Eye in the Sky 40th Anniversary Celebration. I'm ecstatic to be a part of uh, this event, and maybe I'll get you some of those beer connections down the road with some of those brewers, Mitch. You know, I think Thanks, you got man. a little bit more you know, muscle than I do, but since I'm the new guy on the floor. Chris, um, what has it been like to join this team? Tell us, uh, remind us, you know, when did you join the team and um, how, how did it feel to do that? What 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 made you passionate about wanting to do this work with these two fine gentlemen and Lawrence so, as well? I've been one of the guys for about three years now. I was actually teaching at uh, Hayes and Union um, High School and Middle School in Hardwick. Uh, graduated Linden State as a non-traditional student. Obviously loved being in the Northeast Kingdom and had a passion for weather as that's what I went to school for. Just like, you know, Mark Lawrence and Steve, we are all alumni from the atmospheric science program at Linden State. And um, Steve took a little bit of a hiatus and my old professor reached out to me and it was kind of a no brainer. I really felt felt bummed to leave the kids in the middle of the school year. But, you know, not too many meteorology positions open up here in the Northeast Kingdom. So I had to jump on it quick, you know, and uh, it, it obviously, you know, I never really had an interest in broadcast meteorology on TV. Um, so you got to get dressed up, wear, wear makeup and live by a lot of people. So, you know, never was too into that. So and but wanted to stay in a place that I loved and it just all fell into place pretty, pretty amazingly. And I'm super stoked to be a part of the team. We got this crest, uh, question from uh, Christy, who asks, what is the most useful advance in forecasting technology that you have seen in the last 40 years? I'm just going to throw that open to, to all three of you. Hmm. Hmm. 
The most. Well, uh, I would say actually the internet. Hmm. Okay. I'll uh, go with that. Yeah. Because that has allowed us to suddenly access information. We, we really struggled to get, you know, information. Uh, you know, we had great training and so forth, but we weren't always able to access some of the information that, that we knew would help us. And all of a sudden the internet just opened that wide open. We now see more information than we can possibly relay. So that was more information tech, informational technology than, than forecasting technology. Uh, as far as forecasting technology, I would have to say the slow but steady advance in computer modeling um, strength uh, and power that enabled um, more and more accurate modeling of the atmosphere. Mark and I, again, uh, Chris, you'd be interested in this. Uh, we're talking about the state of the art with computer modeling 40 years ago. Um, <laughs> and I, and in fact, I've, I've got some old um, DIFACs, um, prints, printouts of the state of the art computer models from early 1980s, the LFM, the limited fine mesh model, um, where grid, grid spacing was about 110 kilometers where grid spacing now for some of the better models is down around, you know, a kilometer or less. Hmm. Um, the oceans were modeled as a slab of mud. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, what, what were the mountains like, Mark? Um, oh, oh the, the, so instead of Vermont having, you know, like the green mountains and, you know, valleys and so forth, there was one slope. It went from low on the on the uh, Champlain Valley side to up on the Connecticut Valley. That's it. Yeah. That's what the computer thought that Vermont looked like. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I am um, still mystified how you would predict the weather 40 years ago. I have not even of age of 40 yet. So, you know, I, 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 I have no idea to, where to start and um, <laughs> to chime in on their advances. So I, you know, didn't see as the computer models move as long as rapidly, but, you know, I think remote sensing and satellites uh, have come a long way. And, you know, it's pretty ridiculous that you can pop up the the GOES satellite right now and you can see snow, you can see, you know, leaves, you know, or um, the green up starting in the south and working its way up in the springtime. And you can see the white cap mountains and us to have that real time, you know, data of this infrastructure as again, what, what Mark said of, of the internet and we're able to instantaneously eat up and transfer this data between everybody and again have a real-time image of you know what we're predicting i think i take that for granted because again it's pretty mystified about what it was like 40 years ago to me i think everybody uses forecasts in, in different ways um you know i like to listen to them day by day you know i want to know what's happening that day and maybe look ahead to tomorrow but mark you were talking earlier about the three-day five uh, forecast, the five-day forecast. You'll see sometimes on the internet, as you mentioned, 10-day forecasts. You know, we're, we're, we're going to branch out into 10 days from now. Is that even something that we really should be doing, given how quickly the weather can change? Well, um, there there is some skill starting to evolve in, in terms of, you know, the longer range of uh, forecasts, and, and that's great. Um, some of that is simply driven by demand. People want to know what's going to happen 10 days, 14 days, 30 days from now. Um, there are literally out there now uh, very precise, I won't say accurate, but very precise <laughs> forecasts 45 days from now. 45 days. Yes. It, uh, an actual forecast of the maximum temperature, the minimum temperature. Is it going to rain? Is it going to snow? Is it going to be sunny? It's a very precise forecast. I mean, I guess if that's what you want to do and plan things out, that that's fine. You can go ahead and very that. precisely wrong. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I often tell people, you know, behind closed doors, it's not necessarily on air, but we're very candid right now. You know, if somebody tells you forecast over seven days, I probably wouldn't believe them. So, you know, we try to keep it that five to seven is what we're comfortable now. But I'm hoping the future can, you know, hopefully we'll get to the next 40 years where we can comfortably put out that 40 day forecast. Kind of glad you said that, Chris. Thank you. Uh, we had a question from uh, D.C. that had something to do with Mount Washington. I wonder if we can get that back up there so we can have you folks answer that. 
So I've learned so much about the weather from Out in the Sky, guys. Of course, thank you. Uh, still confused about Mount Washington's shadow and its effect on Burke Mountain. And you're going to have to explain that one to me because I, I didn't even know this was a thing. But go ahead. <laughs> Who wants to tackle that one? Well, I, I guess they're alluding to the precipitation shadow um, okay. um, cast by not only Mount Washington, but the uh, presidential range in general. But Mount Washington stands out because it's the highest peak in the in the presidential range. Um, if you were to um, plot precipitation as a function of uh, uh, wind direction, you would see that when a strong southeasterly wind is blowing, uh, you would uh, see uh, enhancement of precipitation on the southeast facing slope of the White Mountains, and then you would see a diminution of the rainfall on the northwest facing slope of the White Mountains. And that diminution of rainfall or rain shadow, as it's, as it's called, would be most intense in the, in the Connecticut Valley because of downsloping and compressional warming of the atmosphere and, and, and therefore evaporation. Uh, and then that shadow would gradually become, uh, if you think of the shadow as being deepest or darkest um, immediately in the lee of the White Mountains, it would gradually become fainter as you move further off to the northwest, but there it would still be noticeable uh, when you get to Burke Mountain. Hmm. Some nice comments from folks who are just really appreciating everything that you, you've done over these years. I do want to ask all three of you about, you know, your the, if you can remember sort of a, a time when you were young, I'm assuming it's when you were very young, when you just realized, I want to be thinking about, talking about, maybe even one day doing weather forecasts. What is it about meteorology that, that hooked you in? Because it, it seems very particular. It seems like something you'd have to have a passion for. Well, I just remember growing up because I was born in northern New York, up near uh, Danamora. And I remember as a kid, I lived over in Potsdam, New York, not too far away from the Great Lakes. Lots of snow. It was great. And then I moved to Connecticut. <laughs> right in my prime snowman building years and so really i just wanted to know when was it going to snow and so that started you know my interest in what the weather was going to do and then the other piece that came in i was in the boy scouts i was doing merit badges one of the easiest merit badges as far as i was concerned the easiest merit badge to get was the weather merit badge because all you had to do was write down the weather for three weeks you didn't have to be right you just had to write it down so <laughs> but I got absolutely hooked. And I mean, I, I don't think I was even in high school and I knew I was going to be a weather forecaster. Chris, what's your superhero origin story for the weather, if you will? So I don't think it was one event like Mark. And I have heard that story for Mark before, um, which is a great one. Uh, but I think it was a culmination of events, uh, you know, kind of wasn't a lost soul through my 20s, but, didn't, you know, had to took a non-traditional uh, ride to college. And so I didn't go back to school in my thirties, but I was a ski coach for about five years in Stowe. So I say I've earned my stripes as a Vermonter cause I've been on VPR and have had a mug at the Matterhorn. Um, <laughs> but you know, so being very into being outdoors and an outdoor enthusiast and having a passion for science and math and the weather kind of just all fit in over time. You know, again, it was never like, uh, you know, a lot of the students I went to Linden State, they, you know, they remember that first thunderstorm or, you know, and a lot of the students really would get amped up about predicting tornadoes and thunderstorms. And I say, you know, I just want to predict feet of snow. So I've always, you know, uh, been to, you know, into the colder climate weather and forecasting. And again, being so integrated with outside, whether it be farming or skiing or snow machining or hiking, you know, if, you know, I got to, I say I have a leg up on most people because, you know, I kind of know what to expect on my days off where other people kind of have to go out and look for it. Steve, how about you? Well, I've, I've told this many times before, but um, for me, it was June 2nd, 1961, when I was five years old. And um, I was eating breakfast on the first day of summer vacation after kindergarten, I think. And uh, a thunderstorm came up and my mom sent me out to call in our dog. And uh, I went out to the backyard and called her and she came running across from 
the cornfield that was a couple of yards away from our house. And she looked quite beautiful. Um, she was white collie. Um, and I looked up from watching her run across, run out of the far, run out of the, I guess it was a hayfield that year, um, and looked up and I saw the clouds um, rising in the, in the west. To me, they looked like huge towers of broccoli. <laughs> I loved broccoli as a kid. Um, and I loved the color. They were uh, what I would say as an adult is a brushed pewter gray. And then a, a um, lightning flashed between the towers of the approaching thunderstorm. And um, it took me many years to tell people this because it sounds so cheesy, but it really happened. I, I heard a voice in me saying, you will be a weatherman. And um, so being five years old, I didn't think anything was odd about that. And so when I went inside, I announced to my mom, I'm going to be a weatherman. And she said, that's nice, you know, because, you know, when you're five years old, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be a weatherman one week and a fireman the next week and a policeman the next week and, you know, conquer the world the next week. But that was the direction of my life. I was absolutely certain I was going to be a weatherman. And Steve, you may have told that story many times, but that's the first time I've heard it. And that is absolutely beautiful. Uh, that, that, is, uh, that was really moving, honestly, all, all three of you. Uh, this is what I wanted to get to was the passion behind all this. I would dare say that that was a, a cinematic uh, memory, which leads me to our, our next testimonial, actually, because we had a listener from South Burlington, um, does, wants to remain, remain anonymous, but um, is talking about uh, a bit of celebrity, if you will, uh, where the eye in the sky made it into the motion pictures. I recall John O'Brien's Vermont movie, Man with a Plan, that came out in 96, starring Fred Tuttle as a farmer who runs for Congress, the actor who later made life imitate art when he ran a real campaign against a Massachusetts businessman looking to unseat Patrick Leahy. But... Back to the movie. It put a huge smile on my face at the time, and it still does when I think about it, to hear Mark Breen's familiar voice immortalized in one scene when we hear a home stereo system tuned to VPR and Eye on the Sky. So perfectly, Vermont. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't get any more Vermont than that. You made it into the movies, Mark. How do you feel about that? Uh, you completely caught me by surprise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you know, it, it, I, actually, somebody sent us, and I, this was years ago, um, there was this, I, I think it was a, a Rolling Stone, and they had pasted pictures of Steve and I on this cover. Yes, yes. Uh, and some, something about eye on the sky rocks, but it was on right on a, a Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's true. It's true. <laughs> I, that metaphor absolutely works. <laughs> and I have run you. I have run you off the road. I think, um, according to Phil Baruth. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me, Steve. In, in some sort of bat <laughs> in some sort of Batmobile. Um, I believe. Remember yeah. those series Phil, of essays he did? Phil, Phil Baruth did this whole, when he, when he was doing the, the, his commentaries, he had this whole um, uh, other world sort of thing going on with Steve and I and, and you know, evil uh, uh, oh, gosh, forecasters. We, and just, we were was, locked into some sort of, you know, <laughs> world-ending con <laughs> conflict or something like that. <laughs> Running president, stealth presidential campaigns at one yes. point, I believe. Yes. <laughs> you guys have kind of done it all. <laughs> hey, uh, Chris Kurtick, I want to thank you so much for joining us today as one of the newer members of the Eye in the Sky team. Uh, your reflections and, and your your presence on the air is really greatly appreciated. I want to thank you for taking the time for, for being with us today or with these veteran gentlemen here, too. Thank you, Mitch, as well as Mark and Steve, as always. It's pretty crazy just being besides them, so... Thanks for that. Usually we're a one-man show, but today we're uh, giving you the whole group group feel. 
Yeah, and let's not forget that beer sometime, okay? I definitely <laughs> want to find out about uh, your, your craft beer aficionadoism. That's great. Um, Mark and Steve, uh, it has been such a pleasure uh, looking back at these last 40 years of this partnership, uh, you know, and obviously we want to welcome in the next uh, 40 as well. But before we do wrap things up here, I want to know if there's anything else that you'd like to, you know, say to the folks who are watching out here uh, who have taken the time to be with you today and and anything else you want to add about your, your time doing these forecasts and how much you've given to the region? Well, I guess I thank you isn't enough to say as far as, uh, you know, not just the people that are joining us today, but just uh, over the 40 years, um, you know, it, it, it has been an, an unexpected pleasure uh, to be able to to be part of this wonderful community. It's one of those, you know, Vermont, uh, things are spread out and, and, you know, we all kind of have our different ways of doing things. And yet there is such a wonderful sense of community. Um, it certainly brings us together when we need to be brought together. Um, it and, and yet those differences uh, give us just as much strength. Uh, so I just, you know, really, 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 really fortunate to, to have been and, and continue to be part of this community. I want to echo what Mark said. Um, I count myself extremely fortunate to have been a part of this community um, in a state that I love, uh, in a place that I, that gives my heart great joy to wake up in every morning and look out the window and and see so from me to all of you out there thank you so much for making all this possible in my life yeah. and i'll echo just one, one more thing that we started out with um you know this amazing collaboration partnership uh between the museum and, and vermont public radio um you know still uh, is the shining example of, of how organizations, uh, when they collaborate, you know, just just what amazing things they can do. Yeah. And I would just like to add that uh, every day I'm on the air doing Morning Edition for Vermont Public Radio. When I play that weather forecast, when I'm about to introduce that, and sometimes I'll just, you know, hit it or sometimes I'll say, and here's Mark Green with the eye in the sky forecast. Uh, I feel a lot of pride in that myself because I know what uh, the two of you, what Chris and Lawrence mean to this region volunteer folks we heard from today who are out there helping you out with that. It's so important in, in any place really, but in a state like Vermont where the weather can be pretty crazy and we saw what happened with Irene, it's a big deal for me to be able to introduce people who have such endeavored such trust throughout the region and also just a lot of joy too. So I just wanna thank you both uh, for being part of that. It means a lot to me as well. And we wanna thank everybody who's attended this virtual 40th anniversary celebration of the Eye on the Sky. Thank you, Steve Molesky, longtime meteorologist and one of the first Eye in the Sky guys. And of course, Mark Breen, senior meteorologist and planetarium director for the Fairbanks Museum and a longtime weather reporter for the Eye on the Sky. Thank you to all the folks who've joined us for this event. That would include Steve Molesky, Mark Breen, Chris Kurdek, BPR Scott Finn and Betty Smith. And of course, you our audience. Thank you to the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium, Lawrence Hayes, and Executive Director of the Museum, Adam Kane. Special thanks to our event sponsors as well, RK Miles and Arter Creek Awnings. Thank you so much again for joining us. I'm Mitch Wortley reminding you to keep your eye on the sky.